Well, first of all, I want to say thanks for coming on. I, I was very uh, encouraged to hear your, uh, to get your email about what you do because the amount of people that watch this show and my buddies, my personal friends who have benefited from service dogs are immeasurable. I mean, the, the work that you do, like it, not only was it a kind of a nice to have, but it was almost to the point of your TED talk, it was a life changing and life saving event. Like they needed these dogs to, um, to not only get through the day, but just to keep moving through their life. So I can't thank you enough for coming on. I really appreciate it. I, I, I think what you do is commendable. And um, I, I think that it's an invaluable service to those who have experienced some of the, the most horrific things that people cannot even imagine. And the service dogs are one of those things that keep them going and get them through life. Oh, well, I'm, I'm really grateful. Thank you for having me on your show. Um, it's you know, to be able to share our journey and to the whole intent is to bring education and hope and inspiration to those that either need a service dog or need to understand the industry and why they are so necessary, especially for our veterans. And so, you know, I, I really appreciate the opportunity. My name is Shannon Walker and I'm the founder and CEO of Northwest Battle Buddies. And I have been a professional dog trainer for 30 years. Wow. And I'm really fortunate that I get to do what I love. My passion has turned into my purpose, yeah. you know? Sure. And so ever since I was a little girl, I just loved animals. I, if there was a stray, if there was anything on the side of the road, walking down the sidewalk or in somebody's front yard, <laughs> I just knew it was lost and needed me. Yeah. And my parents were always, that, that was the tension they had to manage as I was growing up. And we <laughs> did feed a lot of strays and we saved a lot of animals but dogs were so special. And I got my first dog when I was like four or five years old and her name was Buttons. And she was a little black cockapoo, cock spaniel poodle mix. And she just became my world. And at that time, I didn't know that was just going to be, you know, a long list of dogs that have stolen my heart and poured into my life. And when I say dogs pour into our life, I love all animals and I really love horses, but you can't curl up at night on your bed with a horse, right? <laughs> right. And so, but dogs bring something to humanity that I don't believe any other animal on the face of the earth does. Yeah. And dogs have the ability to serve man in a way that no other animal can. Right. And so dogs have found a way into our heart that can be life changing where they actually are saving our lives and used in the service of humans. And so I wanted to be a veterinarian. I felt that would have been my path forward to be able to express my love and dedication to the animals and do it. But, oh my gosh, I worked in a vet clinic and I cried all the time. It just broke my heart. There was too much tragedy, yeah. too much sorrow, too much pain. And my heart, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm people who know me kind of feel that, um, I'm just, you know, so if you look at my, if you look at my personality tests, includer is in my bottom strengths, which means I just kind of want to be a lone wolf, want to go it alone, do my thing. And so my circle in my life is actually pretty small. Sure. I have, and who I love, I love fiercely. So I'm not one of those feel good to where I just cry about every Hallmark commercial. <laughs> right. But I will tell you when it comes to veterans and it comes to animals and it comes to my family, you know, I'm like, don't poke the bear there. And I'm like, right. very, very, you know, very open. I wear my heart on my sleeve. Sure. And I'm extremely dedicated. And so veterinarian wasn't going to be the way it was going to go. And through all of my jobs that I would do, which had nothing to do with animals, mm. you know, I ended up getting a German, my first German shepherd dog. And it's being a dog trainer, because I've been a dog trainer for 30 years, and being a dog trainer is not anything that was even on my radar in our town. I grew up in a cowboy town, Pendleton, Oregon, and my dad grew up on a ranch. Animals were for a purpose. They right. serve. You either eat them or they work. Sure. And my point is, is that's where my dad came from right. in that kind of mindset. And so, and in that town, being a dog trainer, that was not even a thing. So when I moved to Tennessee at about the age of 24, I ended up meeting the man that I would end up marrying. And um, I got a German shepherd dog and he was not into animals as much as I was. And so he, he you know, I had an obnoxious German shepherd dog that didn't have any respect, but I loved him so much. He didn't bother me. Sure. But for um, the man I was going to marry, he's like, get him trained or get rid of him. And that just wasn't even an option. So I started to seek out trainers and I was really blessed to have uh, had the experience of meeting Jean England. Jean England um, 
competed in Schutzen, at, which Schutzen is a sport out of Europe, like police dog training. Mm -hmm. And he also worked with a lot of police officers. So I got introduced to this incredible sport of precision and excellence and healing. And I mean, so it was obedience, tracking and protection work. And yeah. I fell in love with that. And that started my dog training journey because I took my German shepherd dog and was just going to do it, not knowing that just to take your own pet to do that kind of expertise, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. But I did it. And only not because I was good, but because my dog was all heart. And I ended up competing with him. I ended up competing for 10 years. And it really gave me an incredible foundation about discipline and, and how to be a handler and a leader to my dog and take my dog's abilities and his instinct and his drives and channel those into something that was beautiful or that could work like chasing a bad guy or, or sniffing and finding a person, you know, searching and just all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so then I, I got married, had twins, uh, twin boys who now have come to serve in the military, army and Marines, and, um, also work with me now. And, but also through my marriage, I wasn't going well. And I learned, I realized that I needed to make money. Mm. And I wanted to be a stay-at-home mom. So through training in the sport and competing, you know, my dad always said, you don't know what you don't know. And a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. <laughs> so because I knew how to do like three things with my dog, when people would see me in the park working my dog, they'd come ask for help. Sure. And I just thought I'd <laughs> and so I'm like, sure, I can help you. And I don't know if you've ever heard the term fake it till you make it, sure. but I totally did that. <laughs> and God totally protected me because I did a lot of stupid things with some powerful dogs out of a lack of knowledge and kept from getting bit or injured. But I found my way. Yeah. And my goal, my goal was I thought if I can just train four dogs a month, I could be a stay at home mom, pour my values into my children instead of having somebody else pour their values into my children right. and I wanted to raise them. So that was my goal. And I just started putting up flyers, telling everybody I was a professional dog trainer in town and I started doing it. And I remember the very first time I had four dogs, I felt like I had, I had arrived <laughs> because where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. And, and it's all about mindset. And when you decide you're going to do something, you find a way right. and you may not have all the answers, but you find your way. And I've always told my boys, Never quit, never, never have allowed him to quit because that's what my dad instilled in me. You may not know what to do ultimately, but you'll always find something to do next. All you're responsible for is what comes next. So find your way to your next, right? right. Fast forward to doing that for years, outgrew, it definitely grew for more than four dogs a month to train and we needed to find a, a larger facility so we could actually build a kennel and that's the property we're on now. So my for-profit business, Man's Best Friend, I have the honor of working with police departments. I help them train their police dogs. I've trained thousands of, of pet dogs for people who have bite histories, who are deemed to go to be euthanized or to the shelter. But I also have the honor of training, you know, just these little wonderful dogs, you know, sure. five pounds to 150 pounds. We train it. And I've been doing that for 30 years nice. um, with Man's Best Friend. And it, it allowed me, because I ended up becoming a single mom, and it allowed me to raise my boys, be a stay-at-home mom, and do everything here on site where my boys could could flourish, learn, have their first jobs, learn responsibility. And it's been an amazing blessing to have this property, have this business, and have my boys lack nothing, especially right. as a single mom. Sure. And because we never know what life's going to bring us. We never know. And it ne doesn't necessarily go the way it's... I mean, everybody... Everybody experiences trauma. Everybody experiences, you know, hard knocks in life or tragedies or things that they don't realize. But it's about the endurance and it's about the perseverance. Yep. And that's the one thing that is a huge takeaway for what I do now with our veterans. You know, I am a Christian and the there's a scripture, Hebrews 12, 1, that says, let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And it's about endurance. It's about not quitting. Right. And so if you were to look at my life, if you were to look at how I, you know, legacy, what my dad put in me, that really sums it up quite yeah. amazing. And so with that being said, so I founded Northwest Battle Buddies 13 years ago. That is a nonprofit. We provide professionally trained service dogs to veterans with PTSD. We gift these professionally trained dogs. And we are nationwide and veterans come from all across the nation and come train on site with us for five weeks, learning how to navigate life with their service dog. Oh, okay. And so it's been, yeah, in, in the last 
almost 13 years, we have gifted 257 service dogs to our American heroes, and we have not lost one veteran to suicide. Nice. That's awesome. It is. I mean, think about that. The suicide rate among our American heroes is 22 veterans a day. Yeah. That means tomorrow, 22 families are going to be planning funerals. Right. I mean, when you think about that, but but it's a silent, it's over 8,000 lives a year and it's a silent epidemic. If people are not telling it and they are not because veterans are not going to come and tell you they need help. Right. They are strong men and women of courage, selfless beyond selfless. Yeah. And they aren't going to do that. So, so what inspired me to found and start Northwest Battle Buddies was, you know, it all comes down to legacy. And I was just kind of talking about you know, it was really important to me that I instill in my children, my values. Well, where my values came from was from my parents Mm -hmm. and especially my father, you know, so my dad, um, if you go to northwestbattlebuddies.org, you will read my father's tribute. Mm -hmm. And it's actually starts with something I wrote to him when I was a young girl on father's day and I had framed it, (laughs) but it was my tribute of love to him and thanking him for raising me the way he raised me. And then I, I, I put that in there because it really, when you look at legacy, it's not just about, you know, what you're leaving them financially or what it is for them to have a good start in life. And I believe in all that. I believe in, you know, setting my, my children and my children's children up with wealth and with everything else, but it's not just wealth. Wealth isn't just mon- monetarily. Mo- wealth, in my opinion, is values and character and relationships and 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 um, and skills and mindsets, right? I would even say that's even more important than the than the money. You know, the values. Absolutely, it is because because without the values, you'll squander the money. Right. You'll squander the gift because true wealth is wholeness. Mm. How many people have wealth and they? They end their life in suicide. They have everything the world can give them. Yep. And they end up living, ending their life because they're lonely and broken. And so, you know, yeah, that's a lot of layers and that's a lot of podcasts, you know, to talk about all <laughs> right. that. Um, but the fact is, is that my dad raised me to believe in God, family, and country. Mm-hmm. And that when you're in the presence of a veteran, you're in the presence of a hero, even though he never considered himself one. Um I would watch my father go shake the hand of a veteran and thank him for his service. Be, be amazingly uncomfortable if anybody came and thanked him. Right. And he also taught me to believe, like I'd already mentioned, you don't know what you don't know. And my father would never allow us to quit. My father, it was all about perseverance. It was all about character. And he commanded respect. Yeah. My father commanded respect in every room he was in. He had the, the most incredible wisdom. And when he ended up passing away, December 20th, 2011, It was one of the most devastating days of my life because what I was realizing, not only was I so devoted to him, and I I love my mother and she lives with me now and she's 80, but she was a soft place to land and she was just, she balanced my dad very well because he commanded respect and she was, she just was this unconditional love, you know, amazing woman and still is. But the fact is, is that my dad was a source of strength on this earth and no matter what I needed, I could call him. I spoke to him every day throughout my life. And I total daddy's girl all the way to the end and still am. And he, no matter what problem I was facing through my divorce, through all kinds of life, I could call my dad and he would have this way to speak peace to me and speak wisdom to me that on this earth gave me, he was such a source of strength. And when he died, it's, I've heard people say, you know, this broke me and you would have never heard me say something like that. Yeah. But when my dad died, I felt like it broke me. I didn't know how was, I was even going to do one more day. Right. I didn't know how I could even wrap my mind around the thought that this source of, of uh, security and uh, wisdom that I relied on so greatly, I didn't, re- I didn't know how I was going to do my next. Yeah. I just didn't know I was going to do it. And then, and I think about that a lot now with my, tw- my boys, they're 29 and they have their own homes. One's married, about to have a baby like any minute. Oh my gosh. And um, the other one, you know, yeah, I mean, they're both successful. They're both amazing. And I think about what I've learned with my father and how I need to be for my boys because of transition in life and how things happen and setting them up and preparing them and teaching them through all stages of life. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, I thought a lot about what I want to leave them when I'm gone. What do I want to say to them when I'm gone? What do I, I even have journals that I write to them now so they can access 
it when I leave this earth. But anyway, my father, obviously, the way I'm saying it, he just, he is everything to me. Yeah. And so I, I heeded what he said when he was raising me. And I adopted his belief systems as my own. So when a veteran came into my business, I was, I was working at Man's Best Friend. I was washing a dog even. And a veteran walked in. And because he was a veteran, I stopped doing what I was doing. I had somebody take over and I went to serve him personally. And he wanted his personal dog to be trained to be a service dog, Sammy. She was a yellow lab and she was young enough and had temperament enough. And I trained service dogs before, but I had never trained a service dog for a veteran with PTSD. Mm. And so I assessed her and I just started to do what I do. Um, training her, obedience, getting her, getting her ready to navigate the outside world, malls, you know, theaters, restaurants, you know, public transportation, the airport everything that you can imagine a service dog where they would need to go. Right. But then I was also learning about the symptoms of PTSD and the, the tasks that she would have to learn to mitigate the disability of invisible ones of war. So it takes months to do that and to do that right. Mm -hmm. And in my foundation from Schutzen and competing was just excellence in all things, precision, right? right? So anyways, when it came time for Kevin to start training with me, because it doesn't matter how well you train the dog, the dog at the end of the day will only be as good as the handler. Right. And so Kevin needed to learn how to navigate life and maintain and use this tool so he could gain freedom and independence in his life. And so when I started to, you know, talking with Kevin and spending time with him and being out and working in public, I started to learn about the suicide rate. You know, this was 13 years ago. I don't watch the news a lot. I'm busy with my, you know, nose to the grindstone, right. doing what I do and being trying to be productive and all that kind of stuff. And when you hear about the suicide rate of 22 a day, it's just a number. For me, like in the beginning, it was like it was like every other tragedy or bad thing that happened in the world. Right. But when I started to hear his story and it became personal, and I started to hear about his last firefight the some of the six of the of the men and women who were in that firefight with him at, that survived it after coming home had committed suicide on american soil gosh he was a front gunner in the army and even though they survived that conflict they came home and lost the battle it's like how does that even happen i know you know and and kevin had been self medicating with illegal drugs for years mm. Prior to coming to me. Now, by the time he came to me, he was heavily involved in the VA. He was he was not using drugs anymore. And he was on a good path of holistic healing. And that's why he had wanted his dog to be a service dog. His counselor had talked to him about what she could do for him or, you know, that it might be a path forward for him. Yeah. And when I was out training with Kevin, I saw him find courage inside himself to lead her where he was afraid to go alone. And I saw him be willing to do for her what he was not willing to do for himself. Yeah. And it was profound to me when I saw him start to have a panic attack and I was teaching him how to use her and how to use her for grounding and pressure therapy to get him out of his mind and back into the moment of now, how she helped. I taught him how to use her to help mitigate his hypervigilance and even have the courage and use her for social mobility, just walking into those crowds and yeah. doing all the things. So I was asking him to do everything he had been avoiding because he wanted to live his life with freedom and independence and not be bound because veterans with PTSD, their world is extremely small mm. because they're isolated. They right. just don't go out. And when they do go out, it's quickly and it's like in and out to get the milk. It's in the middle of the night. It's when there's not a lot of people there. They are not going out and, and to their children's social school activities. Right. They're not going to the ball game. They stay at home and then they hear about it. You know, they're not in the workforce necessarily. I mean, it's like, it, and so it's not just our veterans, but it's society mm. is robbed from having these amazing human beings invest in their community and bring even greater value of their character and perseverance and everything about them that caused them to do such a selfless act in the first place, which was serve our country. Mm. You know, so Kevin finished his training. I was watching him walk away from our very last training session. He had passed his testing. And as I was watching him walk away, head up, shoulders back, walking with Sammy at his side. She's just following beautifully. And I was watching him walk away and I was hit with the feeling 
that I did significantly made the difference in the quality of somebody's life. Yep. Out of all that I had done in the dog world, I've competed against 13 countries internationally and won. I've won competitions. I've stood on the podium. I've helped, I've helped, uh, you know, I love working with the police officers and helping them get their dogs street ready and all that kind of stuff. Not to mention the thousands of clients with tears running down their face going, can you help me with my dog? Because this dog is about to lose its home and lose its life. Yeah. Or, they're just, or the people are just frustrated. Now the wife and the husband are bickering because all they fight about is the dog right. and what the rules should be, right? I've, 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 had, I've, I've had a life of service in this area. But when Kevin walked away, it was different. It was different because I could see how she had already been changing her life in this new role that she had going from a pet to a service dog. Yeah. And then we fast forward a few weeks because Kevin had then gone back to the VA. And for me, that was just going to be it. I just, I'd done that and I didn't really think beyond that until one day a Vietnam veteran walked into my business, Randy, he had arrived on a bus and he walked in and he knew Kevin. He knew Kevin before Sammy, when, ta when Sammy was a pet and he saw Kevin after she became a service dog and he was using her as a tool to mitigate the symptoms of his disability, the invisible wounds of war, PTSD. Yeah. And, and Randy wanted a dog. And he's this wonderful Vietnam veteran, but I didn't have dogs to give him. Yeah. I didn't have anything. And then I got to thinking, my, you know, in my simple-minded thinking, I thought, if I can just adopt dogs out of shelters, I can train them and I can gift them and say, thank you for my freedom. And that is exactly what I did. I went right out to a local dog shelter. They checked me out because my business been, had a lot of years um, and they were able to check out my reputation. They saw that I had a stellar, you know, record. And I walked away with five dogs at no charge, no wow. cost for free. Put them in because I already had a kennel established. I had staff, professional staff. And, it, you know, I mean, it was heating and air conditioning and big fields to run in. I was already set up. I just needed the dogs. So I, I brought five dogs back, put them in the kennel, and I just got started. And then I was thinking, I need to start a 501c3, but how do you do that? Right. right? Yeah. You don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and I just found my way. The dog training part was easy. Yeah. That's never been a struggle. We, 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 we provide amazing service dogs that are just impeccable in their, in their service to the human and in their foundation of training and excellence. But how do you do a 501c3? And I just thought, surely people will pay for it. You know, it's like, who doesn't love their freedom? Right. Who doesn't love veterans, right? I did not know <laughs> the struggle and what I was saying yes to, but I didn't need to know. Yeah. And it's good that I didn't need to, it's good that I didn't know. It's good that I didn't know because I, I, I'm not going to say that I wouldn't have done it, but I, but I think that's probably like anything in life. You know, we start something, we have a passion for it. We get an idea and there's always obstacles. If you're going to achieve anything great, you better be willing to have pain Right. And you better be, be willing to work hard because there is no leadership without pain. There is no greatness without struggle. Right. And there isn't anybody great that's done anything great or created anything bigger than themselves that didn't want to quit <laughs> possibly a million times over. Right. But it's what we do with those emotions in the moment that will either strengthen our purpose and our resolve or it's going to derail us and we actually then become ineffective and we quit. And then we've lost the opportunity to either develop, do something great or serve others. Yeah. And so anyway, so I started to, as I realized everything that I didn't have to do what I'd sought out to do, I started to develop my team. We perfected our craft. And we built Northwest Battle Buddies as it is today over the last 13 years. I have an incredible team. We have veterans in 27 states across the nation. Um, you know, we're nationwide, even though we are in the Northwest, we serve veterans, you know. So people always ask me, well, do you advertise? How do you get veterans that want to do this? You know, we have 257, I call them missions in action out there. All right living life with their service dog and they are productive members of society they are they are active in their families they've opened up their hearts you know and it's just it in the ripple effect number one cannot be stopped right once you, a human being a great human being that is battling that just needed a they just needed a path forward or something that was going to work for them and then they can continue with all of those gifts and talents and they can continue to pour into others i mean what an incredible gift for society for right sure. 
So we have veterans that have come in. So when you look at PTSD and you look at what our service dogs do for our veterans, I could go on and on and on about the stories. Again, we have 257 veterans out there that have our dogs, but a point to be made is that we have 125 veterans waiting on our list that want dogs. Wow. And that's the last time I checked. This is not slowing down. The need for service dogs is not slowing down. It's actually increasing. Right. And, and we don't advertise. We don't, we just do what we do and it's the word of mouth and wonderful platforms like this Mm -hmm. that family members or veterans will reach out to us and what's really inspiring is a lot of veterans won't reach out to us because they aren't gonna not only do they not know how to ask for help because they're very strong and individuals and but a lot of times they don't want to take something from another brother or sister that is they feel everybody is more deserving and so often when a veteran comes to us We've trained their dog for five months. Now it's time for them to start their five weeks with us. They'll be sitting in front of us for our first face-to-face. At this point, they will have already been in contact with our veteran liaison for possibly months, getting educated and all that. But now they're in front of us. And there's not one veteran that doesn't say, I don't want to take a dog from somebody else that is more deserving. Because not only the survivor's guilt that they have all, all of the stuff that they're living with yeah. and trying to survive, right. And battling. And we tell our veterans, if you're in front of us, this is your time. Do not squander it. And think about it this way. And we tell them, it's like, you be the mission in action. You bring the example of hope and healing to a veteran that is struggling. You be an advocate for a path forward for those that are battling suicidal ideations and everything else. Mm-hmm. But our veterans that are coming to us, they're not sleeping. You know, one of our veterans, he was being interviewed. And so night terrors is a very, very common symptom of and and of PTSD that our veterans are having to deal with. So they're just not sleeping. Right. A lot of times the nighttime is just the worst. Mm -hmm. And so we had this veteran who was being interviewed, and one of the the interviewer asked him, she says, So do you sleep better now that you have Atlas? He has a chocolate lab named Atlas. And he says, you know, I don't want to say that I sleep better. And that actually shocked me. And I was thinking, you're being interviewed. What are you talking about? Yeah. <laughs> he says, I'm not. He goes, I don't, I, don't want to, I, I don't want to say I sleep better. He goes, but I'm not afraid to go to sleep now. Wow. I could not believe how profound that was. Yeah. He says, because Atlas wakes me up before the first part of my nightmare every time. And I... And think about that. It's amazing. You know, people who don't battle invisible wounds of war and PTSD, we live our life without even considering what it's like to go in and grab a gallon of milk. Mm -hmm. We don't even think about sitting at a ball game with a bunch of people around us. We don't walk into a restaurant checking where the exits are. Can I sit with my back against a wall? (laughs) Having a plan. Right. Ready for the unexpected and how they're going to, the hypervigilance, the panic attacks, the, the stress is so real yeah. when they're having to go into the unknown. And the unknown might be a store. We had a veteran that was coming into our office for his interview on day one of his five-week program. He threw up twice in the car on the way and twice in my parking lot before he came into my office because of the stress. And so we have veterans that come in that are on. We had one veteran that came in on 30 prescribed medications a day. Jeez. From his healthcare provider. Now with his service dog, he's on one medication a day. Holistic. With the help of his medical provider, he has slowly and safely gotten all of his meds down to one. That's awesome. We have we have veterans that now can go back into the workforce. So now they're productive. They are achieving. They are providing finances for their family. You know, and yeah. not to mention, you know, one of the most powerful things that so What our dogs do for our veterans is they will alert on cortisol and adrenaline during a panic attack. And often they will start to lick, paw, or even get in the lap of one of our veterans while these chemical changes are happening in their body. And the veteran doesn't even know what's happening yet. A lot of veterans are not self-aware and they they spin out before they even realize they're spinning out. Our dogs stop that. Mm -hmm. And the veterans learn to pay attention to what the dog is doing 
and realize what's happening in their body. So we had a veteran that was being interviewed and his dog was on a down command at his feet. It's T-Bone and, um, and Caden. And he was being interviewed and he gets to an emotional part of his journey. And, and uh, Caden broke his down command and sat up and started to lick his hands. And T-Bone isn't even aware of the dog. This was graduation day he was doing this interview. Wow. Now, I want you to think about that. Veterans who had never even, they didn't want to speak to us. Now he's in front of a camera telling a story. Only after having this service dog for five weeks. The, because b- healing begins on day one. Right. Because they're gaining skills, how to use this tool. So he's telling the story. He's getting emotional. The dog breaks the down command and starts to lick his hands. He's still telling a story. The dog puts his paw on him and starts to continue to lick his hands. And I'm watching this and I recognize the dog is tasking and alerting on his adrenaline. But this is brand new for T-Bone and our veterans have to learn to recognize and then use it and then help this, this task play out. And so then the dog got all the way up with his paws on and started to lick his face. <laughs> and he starts to tell Caden off. And I said, T-Bone, he's tasking for you. Be in this moment, share affection, because then the dog will also learn this is what I'm supposed to do. Yeah. The dog was doing it instinctively, but then we we bring it full fold. Like even when a veteran wakes up from a nightmare, the dog wakes the veteran up from a nightmare. They'll be like, is this what happened? Because this will even happen on their overnights. During the five-week program, our veterans will start to go on overnights with these dogs. And so the veteran will have a night terror And the dog will wake them up. And instead of, because sometimes they don't know what to do. So we teach them to embrace the dog. Be in the moment of now. Feel the hair. Pay attention to your breathing. And so a lot of veterans, they'll tell us, they'll have a night terror. And they will not be able to go back to sleep the rest. And they will stay in that cycle from the nightmare. Mm. But after, but using the dog, within minutes, they can go back to sleep. That's so You know, it's just. It's so awesome. You know, it, it is. And the thing is, is that. You know, the suicide rate amongst our American heroes is 22 a day. It is said so flippantly. But this is why they are committing suicide. This is, I mean, there are so many layers to what they're dealing with right. that that we don't realize. And they are, con- you know, our veterans are continuing to pay a price for our freedom. And they're not even putting the uniform on anymore. Right. And they are a forgotten population. And One of our executives says it best. He goes, it is we the people that need to stand in the gap for American heroes and make a difference with our gifts and talents. You know, I tell people, I'm just a dog trainer. That's, am I more than a dog trainer? Yes. But I was just a dog trainer when I started this. Right. And I found my way and we've developed an incredible team. You know, that has served so many veterans. And we're just beginning. A lot of people in interviews, they'll ask me, what's next for Northwest Battle Buddies? It's like, uh, the only way I know how to answer that is more. That's what I was going to say. Just more guys saved, more people saved. Yeah. That's exactly right. And one of the things that is so compelling is our dogs are there. Our service dogs are there in the midnight hour when nobody else is. And that's where tragedy happens. It's those isolated moments. We, and people will ask me often, they'll say, how do you get through? What, what keeps you going? And it's the stories. It's the stories of our veterans that have our dogs that will send us in a text or a phone call and they'll send us a win. My dog did this for me today, or I did this because of this tool that I've been given. I was able to go and do such and such and and overcome and break barriers that had kept me isolated, kept my world small. I woke up one morning to a text and a photo. And the text started by, because of Talon, his service dog, I'm enjoying another sunrise this morning. And he goes on to say, my broken brain decided to end it. He was all by himself in the midnight hour, sitting on the floor, and he was saying, my broken brain. And he's crying, he's sobbing, he's in despair, and he's so caught up and swimming in his emotions and his mindset that has become what it had become. And as he's, and he had a box cutter 
there as his weapon to take his life. And as he's dealing with all these emotions, his dog snap was relentless. He says, Talon was pawing at me and licking me and pawing at me and licking me and snapped me out of this moment. And he goes, and when I looked up, I saw Talon's face. And he says, and instead of reaching for the box cutter, I reached for my phone to take this picture. And he goes, because of Talon, I am enjoying a sunrise. And because of Talon, Jordan has enjoyed many sunrises since. And he sent me this picture. And I'm going to tell you, I've seen a lot of expressions on a dog's face. I've trained thousands of dogs. I've seen dogs in pain. I've seen dogs about to pass away. I've seen dogs with aggression. I've seen dogs out of their mind. Mm. But this photo, I have never seen an expression on a dog's face like the one he captured when Talon was saving his life. And I, I, I get to do this. Yeah. I get, God has blessed me that as a, from the passion as a little girl of loving animals, having a talent for training and seeking out and perfecting my craft and my, my craft and my skill through decades and to use it, to use this skill, to be able to serve veterans like my father veterans like the men and women my father taught me to respect and my dad was an incredible patriot and he didn't preach patriotism he modeled it right and i get to take my passion and it's become my purpose it's what we breathe at northwest battle buddies we breathe it from morning till night it's how do we how do we reach more veterans how do we do a call to action for all the people within the sound of our voice a call to action for all the people that have seen our veterans living life for the families, 257 families and that circle of influence that that tool, which is a service dog used properly and having a handler, knowing how to use that tool, the changes in the life that have come because we're talking about children. Mm. It's like, these are fathers and mothers too, pouring into their children. Look at <sighs> the tragedies that were mitigated. Because of a service dog, yeah. you know, and um, I'm just grateful to, to my team, to the donors, to the machine that makes it happen, that gets a dog and a veteran to graduation day, yeah. you know, so, and I want to say any veteran that is looking like, okay, or a family member, how do I do that for my veteran? How can I help her? If you're a veteran, you go, well, this sounds really great. What would I say to a veteran like that? Well, first of all, I would say, I promise you, we are not just another organization that's going to let you down. We're not. When veterans come in and they have one of our service dogs, we are a family. and We serve our veterans for the life of the team with education, support, whatever they may need that we can within our parameters. But if a veteran is looking to, what if I could do this? Just what if, what if I was to hope, what if I was to be brave enough to hope again? All you have to do is go to NorthwestBattleBuddies.org and for our veterans tab, click on the application, click, click on the questions and answers because our veteran liaison who serves our veterans is amazing. Number one, she's a former Marine and her husband is a, was a master sergeant in the Marine Corps and he has one of our service dogs named Gabriel. Oh, okay. So not only does she, has she walked the walk, but she's seen it because she was a wife that was advocating for her husband. It's because of her that her husband has this service dog. And what she did is she knew my mother and my mother blew up my phone <laughs> to serve her husband, Vinny. And when veterans apply to Northwest Battle Buddies, they get a phone call and they are reached out within 24 hours. And they, if they are helped through the application process, everything that we need for a veteran to be able to come in and, and all the information we need to make sure that a service dog is a good fit in the life of the veterans that are applying. But she is the lifeline until veterans come to us. She's the lifeline. She's the voice. She's the educator. And she is a bulldog on a bone, man. <laughs> she fights for our veterans. She is amazing. And so, and they only know her by voice on the phone and through email. And the day the veterans come to start their five weeks of training with us. So again, our dogs are trained for five months, but our veterans are trained for five weeks, five days a week. 
And on day one with us, when they're coming in to meet us, Jonna flies from Wyoming into Washington State, and she's there, <laughs> hugging them, wrapping her. I mean, she just, she gives the best hugs. Our veterans say Jonna gives the best hugs. <laughs> but she's there. And then these veterans are met by our veterans that are out there with our service dogs. Veterans that are, have our service dogs are waiting to meet the veterans that are coming in to start their journey. That's awesome. And they're there to say, brother, you can do this. Sister, you can do this. We got you. And they will, they'll talk real. Yeah. You know, and it's just that kind of support. It's that kind of family that is just the journey. You know, I always tell people healing begins on day one. Right. And they never arrive. It's a journey. But healing starts to begin day one. And it's incredible. And I'm just really blessed that, that I get to do this. Do they, um, do the people that are there, the guys that already have the dogs or guys and gals that already have the dogs, do they kind of share their story with the incoming veterans? Mm -hmm. And I'll bet that's got to be an emotional event, you know, just there's somebody who's yeah. already on the cusp of, you know, yeah. and then somebody who's already been through that journey and on the other side, it's got to be something else to, to witness. You know, it is. And they don't just tell their story. They come alongside and are with our veterans every day. So we have, you know, one of the things that's awesome, and this just shows the heart of our military and our veterans, is that once they've received their dog, they're like, how can we give back to Northwest Battle Buddies? What can we do now? Yeah. You know, here they were afraid to go out in public. Now they're holding a microphone standing in front of talking to crowds. If you can believe that. Yeah. The transformation is so organic and so real. But we do. We have veterans that... When they were going through the five weeks, they hated going through TSA. I mean, who likes to go through TSA, PTSD or not, right? They don't like going downtown public transportation on the MAX, which is like a subway and all that kind of stuff. But our existing veterans that have service dogs, they will come and walk it out with our new veterans every day of the program. And be like, you can do this. You can do this. And so they do. They not only share their story, but they share their successes and they walk it out with them. And then they will also continue their relationships across the board. You know, one of the things is, is there's a lot of service dogs organizations out there that are not national and they only serve certain conflicts post 9-11. Mm -hmm. Northwest Battle Buddies is not like that. We are, na we are nationwide, but we serve all conflicts. And it's amazing when you watch a Vietnam veteran mentoring an, a 24-year-old Iraqi veteran or whatever the conflict might have been. Yeah. You know, because we, we, we train with groups of 14 veterans. And so you have many conflicts and huge age gaps, but sure. it does not matter. The camaraderie and the service to each other. And they're like, hey, brother, I won't quit if you don't quit. And the days, because they want to quit. Yeah. There's not, there's not one day a veteran that comes into our five-week program that doesn't want to quit because we are asking them to do everything they don't want to do and go everywhere they don't want to go. And it is strict. They 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 lovingly and sometimes not so lovingly refer to the five-week program's boot camp again. Sure. Because, but the thing is, is that we also tell them the veterans are our mission, but the dogs are our responsibility. Mm -hmm. We have to ensure character, impulse control, dedication, and safety you know, our veterans have to keep our dogs safe right. out in public and they have to gain skills. And we are very strict. Our standard is very high mm. because if it isn't high on our dog training side. So I look at it and I, our team has this attitude. Our veterans deserve excellence all the way across the board. We want to serve them with the excellence that they served us with because every single one of our veterans has an honorable discharge. Mm -hmm. And we want to set them up for success. Well, if we're giving them a subpar dog, we are not helping them. No. If we do not help them handle and teach them how to handle with excellence as leaders, because at the end of the day, the dog will only be as good as the handler. Mm -hmm. if, we don't, if we don't instill excellence in our handlers, then their dog will become subpar and they're going to struggle in public. You know? And so, you know, when our veterans come in, so often, you know, they... They're struggling. And not to mention the anniversaries that happen in those five weeks, the anniversaries of deaths of their best buddies, yeah. or while they're with us, their best buddy commits suicide Man. and they get the call and they have to continue on with their life. It's I'm telling you, life doesn't stop life. And when they're in here trying to fight for theirs. Right. And so it takes the whole, the community and the camaraderie of the group. And they serve each other. And we have so many veterans that have said they'll, they'll pair up with a buddy or in a group. And they'll be like, 
I won't quit if you don't quit. When you feel like quitting, you talk to me because that's the day I'm strong. And the day I feel like quitting, you better be there for me. And that's how they get through. That is how they get through. And then we have veterans that will come in. And so, because, you know, we're nationwide, so we have a lot of veterans that might be in a hotel and the weekends are the toughest yeah. because now they're alone. They don't have their dog that they're bonding to because all they want to do is get through the weekend and get back to their dog right. on Monday. And they'll be like, and so we'll, there's always a veteran that will rise to the top and say, okay, everybody, who's going to be alone? Let's make sure you're not alone. And they'll, they'll serve each other and make plans, invite each other to each other's homes. And they'll start a relationship that will continue through the life of that service dog, whether it's across the states, whether it's through texting, whether it's through phone calls. You know, and, it's, and I, didn't, I never served in the military. My dad served during the Korean War in the Air Force, and my twin served in the Army and Marines. And I never served, but I get the honor of witnessing this and being a part of it yeah. as it's, I'm surrounded by it as they're going through these five weeks. And, and we have the honor of, you know, when our veterans are walking through the mall or walking through the store and they may not have been in a, you know, they, you know, we have veterans that haven't been in a mall in decades. And now they're walking in a mall with their service dog at their side. And we get to walk that walk of freedom with them. Yeah, and it's 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 incredible. You know, I don't think people realize. You know, we walk through the mall, we walk through these same malls and these same movie theaters and these same airports, and people see these guys with these service dogs, and they, I don't think they realize the the gravity of that situation. You know, I don't. Th I think they're like, oh, look at this guy with his dog trying to get his dog on the plane or whatever. But they don't understand that, like you were alluding to earlier, trying to get to sleep at night. Like that's day after day. It's not just one night of night terrors. It's like every single night yeah. trying to get to bed, trying to get to sleep. And that's where the suicide comes into it because these guys, they can't, after a while, everybody has a breaking point. And if you don't have something to offset that tra that that trauma every single day, every single night, then, you know, you're going to end up doing something horrible or drink yourself to death or whatever. So I, I just reach out to people that are look, looking at these people with these service dogs. It's not just a, it's not a scam. It's not just something. It's no. it, these people need these dogs to get even, like you said, to get out and even public. I mean, we take it for granted that we can, that we can do the things that they need these service dogs for. You know, absolutely. That's, and one of the, the tensions that Northwest Battleways has to manage is, is the public is number one, when a veteran comes in with a service dog, you know, and I tell our veterans, it's like, look, when you start to go through the store, and all eyes are, you feel like all, you feel like you're walking through naked right. because all eyes are on them. That's the last thing they want. Right. But we tell them, number one, they're looking at your dog. They're not looking at you. Mm -hmm. But we teach our veterans how to handle the public because, and if people, I was asked in an interview, what could the public do when they meet a service dog? And they were shocked at my response. I said, ignore them. Yeah. Ignore them. Don't go talk to them and ask them about their dog or tell them your pet story. Right. Don't ask if you can pet their dog. It says do not pet. Yeah. You know, the. I mean, but that shows you how how determined these veterans are to survive. Yeah. Nobody wants to walk through life with a service dog 24-7, 365 days a year. Right. Nobody wants to have to do that. Do you realize the inconvenience of a dog that has diarrhea, of a dog that has to be bathed? You know, if it's hot, if it's too hot on the asphalt, if it's too cold, you know, your the dog's feeding schedule, the dog's everything. It's like... This is a serious, huge responsibility, not to mention they fall so in love with these dogs and these dogs become such a lifeline. They would give their life for this dog. Yeah. And now they're protective of this dog. So you had mentioned public. And I'm so grateful you said that because now that the veterans are out there navigating life, they're having to deal with fake service dogs that are trying to attack their dogs. Mm. They're having to deal with the public. They're having to deal with, I have to be polite and I don't want to because I tell our veterans, you know, you get arrested. There has to be a standard. And if you don't have a stand, if your standard doesn't take sacrifice, it's not a standard. Mm -hmm. If our veterans get arrested because they got into a fight over their dog, they've lost their dog. Sure. So they love their dog enough. They learn how to de-escalate and get out of there. Right. We talk to them about all this stuff because this is so real. Or somebody steps on their dog or hits their dog with a cart because they weren't paying attention. So our veterans, you know, we don't want them to be hypervigilant like that, like having to worry about, you know, looking for a threat around every corner, but they are aware of where's my dog positioned? Did I position him safely? Making sure that they position themselves in such a way. It's not just about how to walk a dog through a store or how to use the dog as a tool to mitigate a panic attack. It is, how do I keep my dog safe in the outside world with people who have their face in their phone and are not watching where they're going, or they just, and it's, 
And one of the challenges of that is people out there with fake service dogs because they did just want their dog with them. They yeah. just like people call me all the time on my profession, on my for profit side. And they just say, I want my dog to be my service dog. And I'm like, so the first question I have is what disability are they mitigating for you? Right. Well, I'm not disabled. Ma'am, with all due respect, service dogs are for the disabled. And it is fraud for you to take your dog out. And so I educate them and then they end up either going somewhere else or not working with me or they just now are educated. Sure. But the fact is, is that the the service, the, the dogs that are, a vest doesn't make a service dog a service dog. Right. Training does. Yeah. And that is now, now that our veterans are out there living their life, now they're having to deal with dogs that are off leash trying to attack their dogs and they have to learn how to deal with that. Dogs in the stores, whatever it might be, and the public. And we teach the veterans how to educate the public, yeah. you know, and to act in such a way that the next store owner will welcome another veteran with a service dog in. You be the mission in action. You have Northwest Battle Lady's name on your on your vest and on your card, yeah. you know, just, I mean, that comes with pride and it also comes with an expectation of demeanor and our veterans are out there and they really are. We hear all the time that when they are able, when they're able to go in, even at, you know, the dogs are not allowed in sterile environments and things like that. But even if at the dentist, if they'll allow the dog and the dog is down, you know, against the wall in a down command while they're being worked on and, they're so proud when they are told, this is the best trained service dog I've ever seen. This is the best well-behaved service dog I've ever seen. Or they'll go even to other veteran events and there's other quote unquote service dogs there. But they're told theirs is the best service dog they have ever seen. And they're thanking us. But I tell them, it's like, thank you. Yeah. Because your dog is what we did three years ago matters because we stayed up for success. But that compliment is on you sure. because you're, yeah, it's it's your handling. It's your leadership. And the other thing that's amazing is that, you know, our veterans are taught to be leaders. Our veterans are taught discipline. They are taught. And I'm not going to speak about it like I was in. I wasn't. But I did see my the transformation of my boys that are boys. They're men. Right. They're incredible men. But I saw as, as good as I was as a single mom or I tried to be, I didn't do for them what the military did by far. And they're, they're amazing testimonies of transformation of that. So I have an idea of what they had to learn and go through. Well, what they have to do for a service dog in commitment, leadership, discipline, courage, it all falls in line. So when they come in here and they learn how to, how to handle a dog and lead a dog, it's very familiar to them. Yeah. And they, they, they fall right into that. And it's a, it's a good familiarity for them with the military because they're like, I was trained to do this. Yep. You know, so it's not men, it's on four legs, but still. Sure. And that's kind of what uh, the, it's, there's a lot of similarities to the military. Like you said, the, with the boot camp, they should all be used to going in there and getting training. They should all understand that that's a necessary thing. And then setting a good example, you know, that's always been beat into us as military members. You know, if, when you go out in public and you got a uniform on, you better have your, be on your best behavior because you're representing whatever service, you know, you're in. So they, and so yeah. to your point, when they have that, Northwest Battle Buddies, you know, logo on there or whatever, they're setting an example. They should be setting a good example for your organization and them and the dog. And yeah, so they, they, they should know that. that that should be inherent in, the, in them. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, it is, and it, and it is about education and then it's being, it's about being a subject matter expert in the industry. And that's where, again, thank you so much, but shows like this and opportunities to tell their story and to educate the public in any kind of way that we can. Last year, we provided over 40 service dogs, you know, which is a large number to people that are not in the industry. They may think, well, that's just not very many, but a lot of organizations are smaller and they may provide five dogs. Mm -hmm. And so we really want to have a lot of impact. But I'm also the executive director of the Association of Service Dog Providers. And so it's an elite group of service dog organizations across the United States. Um, and it's that, that advocate and educate and we do everything we can. So there's many platforms that we or titles that we that we, you know, want to hold so we can bring that change in the industry and help clutter up what is, you know, a lot of people, they don't, they're like, what's the difference between a therapy dog and an ESA, e oh, an ESA emotional support animal and a service dog. And there's just a lot of, um, lot of confusion regarding the industry as a whole okay. that the public and, and store owners are having to navigate and try to figure out. So we do everything we can to, elevate our profile and, and, and our platforms that we can bring education and clarity all 
in an effort to pave the way for our veterans. So now that they are out there living their life with a service dog at their side, they can do it as unencumbered as possible. Right. You know, um, because this may, somebody, when they say, well, what are, you, what are you supposed to do when you see a service dog? And I say, absolutely ignore them, smile and <laughs> Nothing, walk by. Right. You know, they might think, oh, I've been doing that because the person with a fake service dog said, do you want to pet my dog? And now they're allowing them to pet their dog. How's the public supposed to know? Yeah. And next well, thing, and then the next time they encounter a service dog, it may be a real one from Northwest Battle Buddies and the thing, you know, then it screws everything up. And yeah, it's, that's challenging. You know, something you mentioned before, you were said, you said it's 257 vets and then 40 from the other organization. But to me, I would think it would be about quality, not quantity. Like, it, yeah, that may not seem like a big number to some, but from the five months of training plus the five weeks, you know, in orientation with the, with the vet, I mean, that's a pretty good number. And you know, you're going to get a quality dog. You know, like you said, if you, if you send out a substandard dog, it's just, it, it could not only, not only may it not work, but it could have negative effects. You know, the guy may not, the dog may not yeah. react to the veteran and he may take his life anyway. So yeah, you got to really make sure that, I mean, as you are, you know, got to make sure those yeah. service animals are doing their job and, and Absolutely. doing the right thing. So, yeah. Absolutely. And, and that is, and that is a huge problem in the industry. That's why I took the, when I was offered the executive director position for the association of service dog providers That's why I took it mm -hmm. is because there are a lot of organizations out there, really good hearted people that want to make a difference for our veterans and appreciate their freedom. And they love the idea. Sure. A lot of organizations, not putting anybody down, but a lot of organizations love the idea, but they don't have the skills or the expertise behind it to provide. And they are providing substandard dogs and the veterans are not being, their veterans are not being set up for success. You know, they might train their dogs. They might train the veterans for 10 days. Yeah. We're training our dogs for 25 or training our veterans for 25 days. Right. And sometimes that doesn't seem like enough and we keep adding to it, you know, and I will tell you, so, and, and then it's not just providing the dogs, but what does the support look like afterwards? Sure. So, so our veterans, um, after they graduate, they come back at their three month mark and they retest because now they've been out there with their dog for three months and we want to see the relationship. We want to be able to answer questions. Now we can answer questions all the line. Our veterans have a line to the trainers that we check every day, get back with our veterans to support them, whatever we might need, continued education if they need to come in here, videos that we've done, because we have a lot of evergreen support as well to direct them, whatever it might be. You know, we're continuing to broaden our base of education and convenience so we can just set our veterans up for success and that as easy as possible across the states, mm -hmm. you know, across the United States. But our veterans come at three months and they retest so we can, because if it's going to start to maybe go sideways a little bit, or there's going to start to be some tendencies, then we're going to see it then. And then they come back nine months later and retest again. Okay. And each time they retest, they sign a new contract with us. And that contract states that they will live their life. How, what got them qualified, they will continue to live their life that way. So it's very, very, it's very strict. It's very dialed out. But and it's very clear. But they sign a contract and make that commitment year after year, recertification after recertification. And a lot of organizations will recertify for maybe three years or whatever it might be. We recertify for the life of the team. Now, on the occasion for five years, we've had veterans that those dogs stayed of stellar weight. They live their life impeccably. They are just killing it in the industry, doing amazing. They will have an option at their fifth recertification that we will offer them, you're done. You okay. just, we, we see the pattern of, and then there's those veterans that we just know they need to have to be accountable year after year. They're still doing a great job, but we want to, so even though we do our numbers, you know, we provide, you know, like I said, like last year, 40, 40 service dogs and things like that. It is all about quality. And I thank you for saying that, but it's also about knowing your veteran and serving them individually. Sure. You know, every dog and every veteran is different. And so even though we have our, our SOPs and our operations and we have really streamlined what we do for the maximum efficiency, value of the donor dollar, protection of the dog and the success of the veteran, but we also have to have that personal touch of what this veteran may need and things like that. And we do that yeah. because we're dealing with human beings. And just because we might have a litter of English cream golden retrievers or lads or even the shelter dog, they still have their nuances. They still have their differences. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's certainly not a carbon copy. 
you know, cut out program at all. It is something that is just very streamlined, but also individualized. That personal attention, I'm sure speaks volumes about the success of the veteran too. I mean, like, you know, like you said, there's probably a lot of people out there, a lot of I don't mean not a lot, but there's some businesses out there that will provide a service dog and they don't check back in and they're just like, hey, go have a good one. You know, good luck to you. You guys yeah. check back in and it, it kind of, I guess we will hold them accountable. Kind of like you were saying, like, okay, man, I got to check in with these guys later. So I better not, I can't slack off. I got to keep, do, you know, vigilant and do the right thing. So that yeah, absolutely. Sense. Well, you no, and you're right. And the thing is, is, and that's the problem in the industry. That's, that's because, you know, I'm not for more bureaucracy. I am not, more, I am not for government involvement. Sure. In it. And I got that from my dad. My dad's like, we don't need more of that. <laughs> but what we do need is personal responsibility. For sure. And if we had personal responsibility in the service dog area and people not taking dogs out and organizations not, you know, there's organizations out there that, you know, they'll charge a veteran $10,000 for a puppy and call it a service dog. Well, that's just a scam. Run and run, run hard and run fast yeah. away from organizations like that. There's no way that calling a service dog doesn't make it a service dog. Performance makes it a service dog. Mitigating, you know, a disability, tasking for a disability, being a tool, teaching the, you know, just all of that is yeah. what makes it happen. And it takes what it takes. People say, you know, I've had people say, well, five months of training and five weeks for the veteran. It doesn't take all that. It does for our standards. Right. It does for our standard. Um, I don't know any different. I mean, I, I don't know any different. And it's not because I don't know any different that we're just stuck to it. I look at it. If we were to lessen anything, we're lessening the excellence. We're, we're lessening the, the, the ability, the education, the tool. We're, and, and it takes what it takes. And what does it take? It takes money. It takes sacrifice. It takes dedication. It takes tears. It takes doing it when you don't want to do it. It takes resolve. You know, COVID was the toughest time. I'll bet. For any nonprofit, I don't remember the number of the thousands of nonprofits that close their doors. But when we, so we take dogs out of shelters, but we also purpose breed. Purpose breeding is where we have, um, we have guardian, we have dogs that have passed all their health clearances and we breed them so we can have a litter of puppies. So we know what we're getting. Sure. And we still, we used to start out all shelter dogs, but now we also do shelter dogs, but we also do purpose bred dogs. And the reason is because when you're a good dog trainer, you can cover up a lot of genetic issues with a dog if you're a good dog trainer. Mm -hmm. But if that training falls, the weaknesses in the dog's temperament come to the surface. Yeah. And when you're dealing with a veteran with PTSD and he's dealing with everything that he's dealing with, if he's if his training or his handling starts to fall at all, you've got to know that genetically that dog is still sound. Well, if you're if you if the dog looks the way he looks because of good training, but he's not really genetically as stable as you would hope, those weaknesses can come to the surface if the training falls, if the leadership falls, and now the dog can be defensive in public. Oh, okay. The dog can start to take over. So we've learned when we're looking at, you know, we don't want to be working a dog for four months and then have to fail him out. Right. Look at the donor dollars and the time you lost. Oh, yeah. And we don't want to do that. That's We got lives on the line, right? right? So we're... So a lot of what we do is in our English labs and on our English cream golden retrievers is we're starting with dogs that are genetically sound. This dog being defensive in public. Now, all dogs can act like dogs, right? Sure. But the fact is, is that when you're dealing with genetics and you're dealing with the breeds that are inclined for the work, there's a reason German Shepherd dogs and Malinois are used for police work and military. Yeah. There's a reason. Yeah, they yeah. are genetically inclined, right? Sure. That's why I have a German Shepherd dog in my home with my 80-year-old mom. I feel safe. Because he is loud when he announces his presence and he will back it up. I love it. I love, love it. Right. And my lab just doesn't bring that. That's okay. My lab brings what he brings and he's my snuggle buddy, right? Right. All of that kind of stuff. So you've got to look at genetics and instinct and all of that to be hyper effective, right? Yep. And so we purpose breed our dogs as well. So back to COVID, when we breed a dog, that sets in motion 18 months of work. Well, when COVID hit, a lot of people shut their doors. We couldn't. Yeah. We still had 60 dogs out there in foster homes. We still had dogs that were coming into our program because they were aging out. So our fosters will, our dogs will be in our foster home eight to 12 months. That's our contract with our fosters who raise these dogs, love these dogs, make them part of the family, all this kind of stuff to let our dogs grow up so they can come in and train with us for five months. Well, those dogs were coming out of homes. Well, what makes rooms for what makes room for those dogs that need to come out of the homes into the training facility to get started 
is our service dogs that are now leaving with our veterans. Right. Well, when you have to cancel your veteran classes, so we had dogs like a train wreck coming on top of the dogs that needed to leave. And you look at finances, you look at space, yeah. you look at veterans who have now gotten reasonable reasonable accommodations from their work for that time period to be able to come for five weeks. You have, They bought plane tickets, they saved the money, they have everything, and you have to tell them, we have to cancel it and we have to wait indefinitely. I mean, these guys are already on the cusp and now you're telling them, yeah. you, not only can you not come, but now you got all this financial burden and you got, you know, oh my goodness. Man. It was, and then we had dogs come out of our, out of foster homes. We had to sell them. What? They, they had the least amount of, of donor dollars in them. We had nowhere for them to go. We had to sell them. And I cried. Man. I stood in my living room, looking at our finances, looking at the responsibility, looking at the outgo, the cost, because we own all these dogs. We have veterans whose lives are on the line. We, I mean, it's like, it was, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't have my, and I didn't have my father to call, Yeah, you know? So, but we didn't quit. We I was going to say quit. that's a testament to your perseverance and your professionalism. I mean, you're here, here you are on the other side of it, you know, doing well. I and mean, that's, that's commendable yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, I will tell you, we pushed, we pushed the pro, I mean, we, 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 we found a way we, cause you can't go out in public, right? So we took our huge office space. We brought our veterans in, we masked everybody. And that's a whole nother thing yeah. if that was effective or not. But we, <laughs> we did our best to, uh, to respect people's anxieties, public opinion, all this kind of stuff. And we did it. We modified our office and we did mock training. We, we made mock elevators. We made mock grocery store lines and how to do checkout. We got a shopping cart and they were pushing it in the parking lot of our <laughs> office, you know, in Vancouver. Just to, we found a path forward. So we didn't have to, you know, we, we were sheltered in forever and chaos. We only had to delay our veterans for a few weeks for us to figure this out oh, and awesome. found forward and we did it and we and i'll be honest we did it under scrutiny i live in washington state and in oregon i mean we're wow. oregon's yeah. minutes away and tifa was there you can imagine the social up you know sure but we pressed through and we just did it and we we took a hit a little bit with public opinion or we took a hit with people walking by but then we also had people going this is awesome yeah this is awesome because and you know what my dad always said that no statue was ever raised to a critic. There is always somebody that is going to tear you down, put you down, tell you, you do, you're doing it wrong, yep. all of that. But you have to look at um, what are they doing? Right. What are they doing for our veterans? What are they doing for people? What are they doing that's selfless? Or they just have, I call it keyboard courage, and they're going to sit there and bash or whatever. Well, you know what? You can kiss my tail <laughs> right. because we're going and it, to, and it matters what you focus on. Mm -hmm. If people are, fix your focus, focus on what's good and what you can do. And, and those were not the people that did have something negative to say, were not the people we were serving. Right. We were fighting for people that fought for us and we recognized what was on the line and it was their life. Yep. So you know what? We'll take it because we believe in what we do and, and it makes us stronger, right? Yeah, for sure. Speaking of, um, uh, donations like there's a lot of us who don't require a service dog but we would like to help out so what can can i assume there's yeah. a donation button or something on the website absolutely, uh, I'm absolutely. Just, okay go ahead yeah yeah so no, it's, it's, go ahead yeah talk to that a little I'm bit sorry. yeah northwestbattlebuddies.org please go and donate please donate our dogs cost us twenty five thousand dollars they are gifted to our veterans there's not even an application fee when these veterans come in, they get five weeks of training. They get continued support throughout the life of that team. They also receive everything that we could possibly set them up for success with their dog. All the materials, food, crates, vests, cards, beds, grooming supplies, bowls. It's like Christmas Day when they leave here with all this stuff and their service dog that they receive, that they are gifted. Yeah. Because our veterans already paid a price, right? So yeah. all of that. Cost, ends up costing $25,000 a dog. It is the American people. So I had mentioned earlier, it is we the people that need to stand in the gap and make a difference for the life of our veterans. And you may not be able to train a dog,
but everybody has $22 a month. Everybody has, we have a monthly giving program, Operation Never Quit. And it is the story of one of our veterans and we highlight our hero's corner. And, vet, and so people who are part of Operation Never Quit, it's $22 a month that they, be, you know, it's a continued, it's a monthly giving program. Sure. And they receive emails, monthly emails, highlighting the wins and the successes of our veterans and what Northwest Battle Buddies is doing in the industry to fight for our veterans and against the suicide rate. And so we need the help of the American people, especially right now at an election time. That's where everybody's giving their money. And I know that people, you know, you're, you're, your heart is where you keep your treasures. All right. And I give where my heart is. And if you love your freedom and the men and women who provide it, or you love dogs, this organization is for you. And I will tell you, we, you can check us out. You can check out our 990s. We have a call to action. We are extremely transparent, but we are incredibly responsible with our donor dollars. And we are, we don't even have a facility. People, so Dog Chow, Purina Dog Chow came out and filmed. They, they support us. They have a tremendous heart for our veterans. They don't support Northwest Battle Base. They support the Association of Service Dog Providers, which inherently, but what they're doing is bringing awareness. They're, they're educating. And they came out and did a bunch of filming of our veterans and tasking and educating and all this kind of stuff because they want to bring education to the industry as well. And they're like, because we're one of the largest service dog providers for veterans with PTSD in the United States. And they're like, where's your facility? <laughs> and like, I'm, we train in the rain. Yeah. You know, I have, I used to have a horse and we have a horse stall. And that's where our veterans are out of the weather to sit with their dog. But when they're in the field doing their training, we're in the weather. Yeah. We are, are, I just couldn't, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't have a facility. We want a facility. So if you have, if you have a million dollars, we would love a facility. <laughs> but that's you what I was going to say. That speaks to, that speaks to your focus and that's, you're, you're spending the money mm -hmm. where it needs to be spent. You're not, yes. you know, yeah, you could probably save up and, you know, uh, d deny a lot of veterans dogs and build yep. a facility, but your, your focus is where it needs to be. And that's, that's, again, that's commendable. I mean, you guys, you guys, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I tell you, thank you for that. But I tell you, when you see a Vietnam veteran in a walker going through my acre fenced field, mm. pushing his dog, pushing this walker with a service dog at his side, whether it's in the rain, we try to not have it be in the mud. We had a huge storm. We were shoveling a path through the ice. It was 18 degrees. And my, my trainers are out there shoveling a path, a big circle in our parking lot so they could start walking their dogs safely, not on ice. They're out there hours before our veterans get there. They're in gloves. They're bundled up. We don't quit. We train in it. Yeah. Now, I'd love for our Vietnam veterans to be on safe footing where it's warm. Sure. And I'd love for all of our veterans to have that. But I'm just saying our Vietnam veterans, when you see them out there in their canes trying not to fall. And they're like, I'm doing it because we're like, do you want to do it over here? We could modify this never to compromise the we never compromise the standard. Mm -hmm. But there's times, you know, we can modify that. No, I'm doing this. And you watch that. You watch this determination and they're just gritting it. They got grit. Yeah. And I sit there and I watch that. And I just am so emotional because that is the people that we're serving. And that is what America is missing. Right. Is grit. And a, fortu a, a, a fortitude that they're just, they are not going to be denied. And it's incredible. But yes, we need donor dollars. We need, uh, we need, we the people to donate to Northwest Battle Buddies and help us get another veteran off the list. Get another veteran. Uh, right now we have 125 that have reached out to us. They're looking for hope. And they're just praying that this is going to work because they're trying to find a path forward. These are mothers and fathers, sisters, brothers, sons, and daughters that are that are tied to people that love them or they're all alone thinking that they're forgotten. Yeah. Well, they're not. So they need us and they need you and we need you. So northwestbattlebuddies.org, please donate. Or if you're a if you're a business, man, rally your employees, do an event, send it around Northwest Battle Buddies and donate. We have that. We have people that businesses that will partner with us. We have people that will put us in their legacy. They will put us, you know, they're, 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 they're putting together their trust. Right. And they will, and we need all of that because it takes all of that. Do the math. 125 veterans, $25,000.
And we are no different than every nonprofit. It's like, I didn't know that when I founded Northwest Battle Base, I was going to have to become an expert in donor relations. <laughs> yeah. You know, and beg for money. Yeah. And if you know me, oh my gosh, I'm like independent. Yeah. Hyper independence is that as a single mom, you kind of gain those, you know, you sure. fight for you and your, your loved ones. I was totally mama bear, but I'm just saying, so NorthwestBattleBuddies.org. We need the help of the American people. We need people that want to foster our babies, our puppies. You know, we need people to educate, you know, join. Yeah, we are on Facebook and we have NorthwestBattleBuddies.org, our website. Check out my TED Talk. It tells the story. Oh, that TED Talk is great. That's a fabulous TED Talk. Yeah, I encourage everyone to look at it. And you, there's a link on the website, right, to the to the TED Talk? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's Shannon Walker, Beneath the Surface, PTSD. If you go to TED, TED Talk, yeah, I think it's got over 50,000 views or something. I'm not it's quite awesome. sure, but. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't remember the vet's name on there, but do you, I mean, but he was, Gordon. yeah, Gordon just, and Flame. man, that was, that was awesome. It was really touching. Yeah. Yeah. It was, um, you know, I will tell you, yeah, I don't want to ruin it for everybody listening to it, but I'll just say this, you know, when I got called, I got offered to do a Ted talk and I'm, I got my nose in a field with a dog and veterans. <laughs> I'm, I'm not on social media. I don't do all that kind of stuff, but now I have my own social media platform because that's just the way the world is going. Sure for education and to be a subject matter expert and a voice and to bring everything you can to affect impact influence and all that. But I got asked, you know, do you want to do a Ted talk? And I'm like, what's a Ted talk? I never even heard of one. <laughs> and they're like, well, you just got to talk in about 500 people for about 20 minutes. I'm like, okay, sure. And then I went to my first meeting and I was like, Oh my Lord, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> And they supported us and it took me about six months to put the TED Talk together. But I felt like, as I mentioned earlier, I competed in Belgium in the Schutzen sport against 13 countries mm -hmm. in 2003. And I won in my category. I felt like when I was preparing for this TED Talk, I felt like I was getting, preparing for a world-class competition. <laughs> I was like sick. Yeah, it was like I was so grateful when it was over. But I'm really proud of it. But people need to watch it, not only to hear what our American heroes need, but they need to see Gordon. Yeah. Gordon is Santa. Gordon is grandpa. But you'll hear, and it, I won't ruin this, I promise. But he used to, he had survived a suicide attempt already, but he had already had his plan. And there's not one veteran I meet that doesn't already have a plan. They have an exit strategy. Right. And he would spend every morning in the shower deciding if he was going to do one more day. And I'll leave it there. Yeah. And you can listen rest it's, it's it's incredible it's really it's really powerful for sure and you nailed yeah. it you nailed that ted talk it was great it was a fabulous thank ted you. talk yeah thank you i appreciate it it was uh it was an honor to do and i'd love to do another one because now um it would just be more yeah. you know how that goes you know and i've already said that but no it's it's incredible and uh you know you know one last thing i'll say unless you have another question or whatever um because i could talk about this all day <laughs> right. because we have a stories for our veterans. But the fact is, is that, you know, I said it earlier, it really is we the people. Mm -hmm. It is we the people that have to stand in the gap for our veterans. Our veterans, every veteran out there is still paying a price for our freedom. They, they don't have to have been in combat. They don't have to have been physically injured in order to still be paying a price. So even though they're not putting the uniform on, their lives have been permanently changed because they're different now. Mm -hmm. I have veterans that say, you know, I just want to get back the way I used to be. They never will be. Right. But it doesn't mean they can't learn new skills moving forward and have an incredible, fulfilled, impactful life and bring value to their family and their community. And they need our help to do it. Yeah. And we can't do it without you. Northwest Battle Blaze cannot do it without we, the people. And that's where everything great starts. And so I just thank you for in advance for anything that anybody will do that hears this. Right on. Well, Shannon, this has been wonderful. Thank you very much for coming on here. I really appreciate it. And I hope, like I said, guys, if you are looking to get a service dog, if you're struggling out there, get with, yeah. get with Northwest battle buddies. And if you're not like guys like me donate, you know, they need, they need the help. So man, I thank yeah. you very much for coming. I really, really appreciate it. Yeah, it was an honor. Thanks for giving me time to say so much. It was like sometimes I'm like my quick elevator speech or whatever, but you really allowed me to share my heart on another level. So thank you so much for this opportunity for me um, to be able to share my heart. And anybody that hears this, you know, please 
do what comes next. Do something for a veteran. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Take care. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.